Welcome, guys. This is episode three. I am authentic, and we're super excited to have you guys. I am Taylor Mathis. I am a 2021 candidate of the Master of Finance program. How about you? Uh, my name is Nimi Ajayi, uh, first year MBA, um, graduating in 2022, um, major uh, concentrating in healthcare uh, strategy and marketing. I'm Michael Parker, also a 2021 candidate for the Masters of Finance program. Today, we're just going to have a candid conversation about being authentic in your educational career. So not just here at Vanderbilt, but also in your undergrad, middle school, high school, however deep you want to go. So <laughs> we could just first start off with what does authenticity mean to you? I think authenticity is pretty much like not being afraid of really being who you are. Um, you know, a big thing for me when I was growing up, like not growing my hair out. Mm -hmm. um, my hair, when I was born, started off really straight. Like you really couldn't tell I was a black kid because it was light, straight hair, whatever. Um, you know, and to like avoid any problems, I just kept it short. Um, but because of COVID, like being at a place where I feel a lot more comfortable being who I am, this is the longest I've ever grown it. So, um, you know, no plans to cut it like in the future or anything, but it's just the simple things like that, like being able to kind of really be like who you truly are without worrying about any repercussions or stuff like that. Oh, wow. I've only imagined you with your fro. Yeah. I've never seen it cut short. I like the fro though. I, like I do it. too, thank you. It's the curl pattern. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Yeah, um, Yeah. I think uh, everybody is a sum of their experiences. So I think being authentic is being able to take your experiences with you wherever you go. Mm. Um, you know, I am originally from Nigeria. Um, I've lived in a couple of cities, Minnesota, Ohio, it's being able to carry all those parts of me uh, to any environment that I find myself. Uh, to me, that is authenticity. So I can go, you know, from talking about African food right to talking about, uh, you know, what, what's what's good in Cleveland. I actually don't know. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, it's just just being able to um, relate to all the parts of yourself that that make you you. That that is authenticity to me. I believe like a mixture of everything, like owning who you are and owning what you've been through mm -hmm. is authenticity, but also being confident to not only own it, but to share it with others. Right. So like sitting here and being able to say like, okay, cool, like you're Nigerian, owning that, your curl pattern. Like with me, it's like, okay, cool, my mom's Jamaican, my dad's American, owning that, owning that I'm a black woman, owning everything that right. comes with you. Mm -hmm. So I definitely agree with that. Yeah. I would say, as you were stating, you feel like you're being the most authentic self here at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. So how did you get to that journey? So a big part of it is really like the people you're around. And it's hard for some people who might have grown up in some areas or, you know, like a 15 year old doesn't have the choice of where they want to live or go to school. Right. Mm. Um, but it's really like the people you're around, how comfortable they make you or how accepting they are of you and then kind of how you grow into it. So another thing, like like you were saying with different parents, my dad's mixed, my mom's black. Growing up, it was always like, how black are you? It's not the whole like, oh, both your parents are black, so you're just black. It's like, are you half black? Are you a quarter black? So it was always like having to go through that with people for years. And then like I just started hanging around with different people and it just stops, right? Like no one asks that type of question and then it's just something I don't have to worry about. So like not thinking about it all the time kind of just lets me like grow into being normal. You know, I don't have to worry about how I'm gonna respond to the question. I don't have to worry about should I be acting like 50% black today or 25% black today or whatever. It's just like I am who I am, you know? So I think that's, that's a really big part of it. I love that. Yeah, I mean, kind of going off of uh, what you were saying, um, you know, it's the, my African and my African American, you know, I've lived half of my life in Africa, the other half here and having to decide that, you know, when people look at me or meet me for the first time, which one am I, uh, you know, having to decide, am, am I all of them? Am I this today? Am I that tomorrow? And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a constant um, thought process in your mind as you interact with people. 
I would definitely say so. Like even um, as simple as my mom cooking curry chicken, and now I smell like curry chicken. I have to go hang out with my friends. It'll be like, oh gee, like when I was younger, it's like, oh gee, I gotta go stop at like um, Bath and Body Works to get some perfume. <laughs> but now it's like, okay, you want a plate? Like let me bring a plate for you. Like it's right. really good. Now I like cook it well not curry chicken anymore but curry on fish or anything it's like okay i love this like i like it mm -hmm. and it doesn't just stop like here it's not like we woke up yesterday and said oh yeah we're going to be authentic a hundred percent like do you foreshadow even transitioning into the corporate world that it's an uphill battle like how are you preparing for that so it's definitely it's definitely like a drastic process it's not something that can happen overnight um especially like with the finance background, you know this for sure, the more generalized, it's, it's not that much different. It's still a problem. It's still something we all, we all need to deal with. Um, but I think, thankfully, it's starting to change, you know, a little slower than we want it to. Um, but it's definitely an uphill battle. Some areas are more welcoming, like the venture capital and tech space. It's gotten a lot better at realizing diverse voices are needed. Um, and through that need, they understand that like we should be a lot more welcoming than we currently are, or they should be a lot more welcoming than they currently are. So being able to kind of take advantage of those types of spaces and realize that, hey, people here are starting to see that they do want us here and that we do deserve to be here might, as time goes on, make the process go a little bit quicker. I can definitely agree because it's not just value and diversity, it's mm -hmm. value and authenticity. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to hire someone that doesn't look like the norm or what's generally in that space, but if that person comes and they're like masking who they are, they lose their value essentially. Mm -hmm. It's when they come up authentically and say like, okay, this is my experience. Like I'm not going to blend in. I'm actually going to take up room. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree with that. Yeah, but I do think people also, it, it's... I think it's half the battle to want to express yourself. I think you also mentioned that the environment also has to be accepting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a huge part. You can come in on day one and want to be who you are and very quickly realize that nobody really cares what you bring to the table. That's original. They want the status quo. They want, you know, this is how we do things. And I was, I was, I'm supposed to have been hired for my difference, but you want me to essentially blend into um, you know, tailor-made, cookie-cutter uh, um, type of way of thinking, type of way of acting. And I think that that is, that is generally challenged with corporate America um, that I think a lot about, um, you know, being an MBA, being wanting to be a future leader. I look at a company and I, you know, look at, you know, their board. I look at the, the, their leadership and what do I, if I don't, like, if I don't feel like I, I will be accepted, um, you know, just based off of that, that, that goes into my decision making as to, you know, where I go career wise, because I, I want to carry my difference with me and bring it into the room, like you mentioned, and take, take up my space in the room. I was going to say, like, you don't have to go deep into it, mm -hmm. but do you have a personal experience where it's just like, oh, wow, they hired me because I am me. And then you walk into the office and you're like, well, am I me? Like, am I going to be me today? Like, maybe I'll try tomorrow. Um, well, I, I have, I've had some of those experiences, um, and I don't think it's as much as maybe my difference wasn't welcome. It was, it was picked out as, you know, unique. I've, I've had somebody tell me, well, you're pretty smart for an international, you know? So it's, I wouldn't, they, they were clearly highlighting my difference, uh, but in a, in a way that, you know, made me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I started to question what the person's perspective of an international was. Do they think everybody's dumb or do they think everybody's stupid? Then you start to have those questions and it kind of starts to snowball, right? And you start to notice, you know, some other things here and there that, that might make you, um, you know, feel differently. Um, that not necessarily that you're not welcome, but you're just, um, you're, you, you can feel like a photo op sometimes. Yes. <laughs> that is the perfect word. <laughs> yes. I was saying, how did you like overcome that? Have you ever felt like a photo op and where you're just like, okay, like, do I take this picture or do I just like walk away? Like, what are we going to do here? <laughs> so the same thing, like off what Nimi said, during undergrad, um, we had like our orientation before class starts when 
all the students choose their majors and everything. And so what I picked, I was like the only black kid out of you know a group of 70 or something, right? So the person running it um, finds my dad later on during the day and is like, oh, are you Michael's dad? Um, and my dad's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I am, actually. Um, and she's like, oh, yeah, I could tell, you know? And that, it, it was just some out of place comment. It's like, okay, I wonder why. You know, I wonder how you could have told. Um, <laughs> but so, like, to what Nimi was saying, it's like people who recognize, like, oh, this kid's different, but then that's kind of just where the conversation stops. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, they're just here, and that's it. Um, they don't bring anything different to the table. This is through their eyes. They don't bring anything different to the table. They don't have any unique experiences to talk about. They don't have anything to add. They're just different, right? So then that goes into the whole photo op thing of potentially being like the token person. And certain institutions will want to kind of represent and say, look, we have people from this background. We have people from that background. But then what are they doing for us? Like they just want us there to kind of act like we're here, act like we're a part of their organization. But then when it comes to maybe some different things that we might need or some different things that we want our voices to be heard or we want to talk about some changes that might need to be made, you know, the ears kind of turn off. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been really hard to kind of walk through to kind of treat how you've been treated where it's like they don't want to listen to us, they don't want to kind of take us for who we are. So why should we kind of perpetuate this and potentially hurt people coming after us? Yeah. Um, so that's the perspective I've kind of had on it. I still grapple with that, you know, to this day. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> I say, yeah me too. <laughs> We're still growing. It's fine. I would say, like, especially work field or even educational with code switching, it's what is your view on it? Do you find it beneficial? Do you find it masking? It's always pros and cons depending on your respective view. So when you hear about code switching, have you ever indulged in it? And how did you feel? Um, you, you indulge in a little bit of it every day, to be honest. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to come out guns blazing. This is who I am. But you also kind of have to read the room, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think you never really know how ready the person across the table is uh, when it comes to accepting who you are. So you kind of have to read the room first, understand what their perspective is. Uh, but walking into the room, you've already made some certain decisions. I actually remember um, when, I was, when I was thinking, when I was about to do my Vanderbilt interview here, um, my hair was big, my beard was, you know, uh, you know, I was like, I really want to just be myself and, you know, do this interview. But again, you know, understanding the reality of what it is, will I be perceived as threatening? Will I be perceived as, um, you know, uh, too black or, or something like that. So, you know, I, I talked to people around me and everybody was like, you better do yourself a favor and just cut it, you know? And I did, uh, but I know I, I felt like I regretted it after the interview. I mean, I, I was able to be myself in the interview, uh, but, you know, I had already made a decision to, to hedge against any potential risks of you know, <laughs> keywords, head at risk <laughs> <laughs> against any potential risk that I might be perceived a certain way. So that's understandable. Yeah, and that's that's something I really agree on. Um, I'm not my personality type's a little different. So, like for my Vanderbilt interview, hair was out. Um, I don't have a beard because I can't grow one, but <laughs> um, mustache was like trimmed, but it was still there. And my train of thought was like I. You know, I'm who I am. If I don't get it because of my hair, that's, I don't know if I wanted to be there in the first place. Right. Um, you know, all throughout undergrad for investment banking recruiting, right? Did I miss opportunities because of the way I speak or because of how I looked on the day during the higher view interview? I don't know. Um, I could have, I could not have. It doesn't really matter because where I am right now, I'm really happy with what's going on. Um, but code switching, I think is another thing that hopefully will start going away at an increasing pace as we start seeing a lot of changes. Um, but it's something that has been extremely necessary um, for us historically speaking. Yes, I find myself like, even if it's, <laughs> my undergrad institution was very strict on how you 
showcase yourself. So like sophomore and freshman year, I had to wear stockings every Monday and Wednesday to my leadership class within the School of Business. Um, you can dye your hair. I don't, I love hoop earrings, but as you see, I'm not wearing them. I'm wearing studs. <laughs> so I feel like code switching is not even just for corporate. Like depending on who I'm hanging out with, I mm -hmm. might wear something different. I might showcase a different side of myself. So I think code switching is valuable to a certain extent if that makes sense, like there's a level to where it's like, I'm not hiding myself, but maybe I'm not gonna show you that side until I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like goes on to the fact of the environmental standpoint where it's just like, even if I bring my whole self to this job, to the school, if I don't feel comfortable, it's just, I'm an outlier. Like who wants to be an outlier? Mm -hmm. Like right. some people find confidence in that and that's cool. But at some point it's like, when you're at home by yourself, you feel drained. It's right. just like, wow, mm -hmm. yeah, that was a long not day. I don't think it should be portrayed as like a positive or negative thing to an extent either, right? Because some people prefer, you know, if I'm going into this room, I know it'll be easier for me to act a certain way. So then you don't go home three hours later exhausted because you spent, you know, the whole time justifying how you look or like what you're wearing or whatever earrings you have in, right? Yeah. So it's, you know, it'll change for every person, I think. Um, and just, yeah, it'll, it'll change for everybody. Yeah, I mean, like you were saying, I think the you mentioned justifying things, mm -hmm. and I think that that is a major reason why people do code switch. I don't want to have to talk about me wearing Jordans. I don't want to have to talk about you wearing hoop earrings to everybody. Oh, those earrings are so nice, but what are you really asking, though? Mm -hmm. You know, like where did it come from? It, you know, <laughs> it, it's you know just having everything that you do being laser focused on and wanting to be uncovered. Yes, you people want to learn about you, uh, but at some point you start to, f you can start to feel like, um, you know, something behind a show glass that everybody's like, you know what, what's what's that thing over there? Like, what what is this thing? And I don't want to feel like that. So sometimes, you know, um, it just saves everyone the trouble, even though, you know, sometimes it's nece necessary to teach people um, about you because that way, you know, if if you don't do that, they wouldn't learn. Um, but actually, they can learn. There, there's there's Google. Um, to to if you if for those that are really um, interested in learning, um, there are ways to educate themselves on on whatever it is. But I think sharing experiences is beneficial to the entire society. I learn from people every day. It's okay for them to learn from me. So. And I would say, what is the fine line from being the spokesperson mm. to sharing? <laughs> Like, I'm not the spokesperson for all black women in the entire world, I promise you. But yeah. I will also share my experience of being a black woman. So have you guys ever been a spokesperson or was that fine line for you? So there was actually a day um, when we were doing our summer internships this last summer um, when a lot of the Black Lives Matter protests started kicking off. Um, my firm actually took a lot of time to have all of our teams, like all of our silos, kind of spend time with each other, talk about what's going on, go through everything. And at the time, out of maybe like 80 people on the investment team, there were three black guys. Mm -hmm. um, one full time, I was one of two interns. And so the day before a lot of it started, my VP, who was an Asian woman, so another diverse person in the crowd, was like, look, today, is not your job to teach everybody. Um, you do not need to be the person that 77 other people are coming to asking questions. Um, feel free to give your input on what's going on, but if at any time you know you need to tap out, your, you're not here to explain to everybody else. They're here to learn. They can go somewhere else to learn as well. So it was really helpful to kind of have somebody else come in and kind of take that burden off of me um, because I was prepared to be the guy that 70 other people were going to come to and start asking a ton of questions, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's just really helpful having other people kind of come in and realize that there is that line there between being spokesperson and then kind of just being like a sounding board or a better teacher or something like that. Um, but it's a, it's a thin line that, you know, some people do cross, some people don't. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> I yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it depends on the environment. It's it's difficult not to be if you're the only one. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if, even if the burden is shared between three people, it makes a, it makes a lot of difference, and that's where representation matters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes what I tell some people that ask me certain things it, is, if you really cared to know, you would also, um, you know, whether it's a, an organization, whether it's a school, whether it's, you know, religious institution, if you really cared to know, you will advocate for more people like me here. It's a lot easier for um, you to get, it's like osmosis, right? If, if there's more people around you, somehow that experience seeps in. You wouldn't even have to sometimes ask those questions. You will just see it around you and you start to feel it, you start to understand it a little better as opposed to, you know, just asking questions. And it, don't get me wrong, asking questions is great, but I think um, representation, t like you mentioned, takes that burden off. If she wasn't there to tell you that, you know, you didn't have to do that, like you said, you were prepared to, you know, rattle off the entire day mm -hmm. what your experience was, you know, in an attempt to teach 77 people that would most likely forget the next day. Right. Um, but you will leave there feeling, you know, worn out. So, um, but if it was just one question, two questions, no problem. But chances are, if you're one of two or the only one, you will get a lot of questions. Um, so, um, you know, representation matters in, in helping people be themselves and feel like themselves in, in certain spaces. And with representation, I would say, do you think if you have representation that fuels your authenticity? Like, if you had someone that looked like you and they're in a higher position, like let's say a professor or a faculty member, a staff member, or even in the work field, a VP, if they look like you, does that make you more comfortable to be your authentic self? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, part of it is, for lack of a better term, they've survived this long, so you know I will be able to too. Um, but then on a deeper level, it's like someone who's there who can provide real, like relatable mentorship instead of just career advice or like what to do on the job or whatever. It's how to do this job while being a black person in a room full of white people. Um, that type of input is exponentially more valuable than just here's how you do the job. So having someone who looks like you in multiple positions of power, I think is just extremely valuable. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a there's a reason why you know even organizations have blueprints. They have materials that they can go back and look at when a similar problem you know occurs. Uh, you know, if I if I get into a space and I see maybe a leader that looks like me, I observe for a little bit. How are they moving in this space? Uh, how are people accepting them in this space? That gives me more confidence. Uh, makes me feel a little bit more comfortable, relaxed. I don't have to essentially move like they do, uh, but I, I can I can try to figure out what the range is. You know, there are certain things they do, there are certain things they stay away from. Um, I can get the lay of the land and understand what's acceptable and what's not. Um, so it, it is definitely very, very helpful. Um, you know, not even also just to not make certain mistakes. Not that certain things could be wrong, but like you mentioned, having that mentorship is really important because they're, they've been there, like you mentioned, they've survived that long, uh, means that it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, if you see a company or something where it's a revolving door for people of color or diverse candidates, you know that they didn't survive that long um, and you're able to make your decision based off of that, that piece of data or something like that, so. I would have to say in my previous internships, my favorite coffee chats were office hours, as you would say, was definitely with someone who looked like me. I would have mentors, whether it's a different gender, a different ethnicity, a different race, but my favorite ones where I can literally let my hair down and say, okay, well, I heard this and I don't know what to really take from it. Like, what should I do? It was definitely with someone who looked like me. And it's not to say that my other mentors are not valuable because they are valuable, but it really helps to hear like, what was your experience when you were an analyst? What was your experience when you were an intern? And how can I better, like, prepare? How can I better perform with your advice since you are literally in my shoes? Right. right, because context matters. You can't start to explain context to somebody that might not have had the experience. 
So it, may, it makes it a lot easier to relate to, to people. They, they I, w I don't want to say know the struggle. They know the challenges um, that you're probably up against, and they faced it too. So you're able to say, okay, how did you go about this particular thing? But if, no, if you're talking to somebody that never faced those challenges, was on the other side of the table maybe at best, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a different experience. It's a different experience. It is. And then last question of this juicy conversation. Um, what would you say is a time where here at, in grad school at Vanderbilt that you brought your whole self and you, you felt really good about it? Like I was really authentic and I felt like I shared a piece of me. A hard question. I'm, I, I have uh, uh, a time um, in K Pace's class. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> <Kay Pace>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were supposed to bring our favorite hats to class and just talk about it. And I wore a traditional Yoruba hat, uh, you know, to class. And I had people ask me about it. Uh, but it was, you know, me feeling like I could, um, you know, tell people about. Where I'm, where I'm really from. I mean, it, it did look funny to some people, and you know, I got a, a couple of, you know, what is that? You know, like, but um, I definitely felt in that moment that, you know, I was myself. This, this would be me if I was going to, uh, you know, a really grand party back in Nigeria, and it just felt, I, you know, I've, I've visited Nigeria recently, but I don't get to wear it often. Um, you know, here I've, I've worn Nigerian attire before, and I've been asked if it was pajamas. You know. You know, so it's like in that moment, I was like, "Yeah, this is me. This is this is who I am," and it was received well, and I, I was definitely appreciative of that. I like that. So for me, there was one situation. It kind of like was spawned because of class and didn't happen, you know, directly in class the entire time. Um, but I'm taking entrepreneurial finance class, which is super related to venture capital, which is where I'll be going after I graduate, and we got the opportunity to kind of explain like why we were taking the class or what we plan to get out of it. And so a big reason I am, and then also a reason why I'm going to venture capital is wanting to learn more about startups to support like underrepresented founders. Um, one, because like no money goes to underrepresented founders in the first place, but also they tend to have startups and business plans that kind of benefit those of us who have not benefited from these other types of businesses. Um, so healthcare startups that might help, you know, the African American community who's really struggled with healthcare healthcare outcomes given our current system. Mm -hmm. um, just trying to find startups that are really helping that landscape is something I look forward to. And then I was given like the opportunity to explain that one in class, and then a lot of people afterward who were also in the class like came to me on their own time and were like, "Hey, like that's really interesting. Can you tell me more about it?" Um, so it's just like a lot of people who are really open to learning a lot more, and then kind of learning about like why we are truly like who we are and what's driving us and they're actually interested. Um, so that's been a really big part. I love that. I would say mine was definitely embracing that I went to an HBCU. Um, at times I would hide it because it's like, what is an HBCU? <laughs> and I'm like, it's a historically black college and or university and I have to explain it. But actually explaining it here helped me become more comfortable with saying like, yeah, I went to Anton to those who don't know about HBCUs in a state like, yes, like it was a wonderful experience to be a majority, but yes. <laughs> Thank you guys for talking with me no. about being authentic. Of course. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us on, on this episode. Yes, no problem. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Yeah.